Welcome to What a Word is Worth, a space for creative minds to speak about viable ways to heal the world through writing and other invented mediums. This is your host, Marianela Medrano. I am the founder of Palabra Training Center, where words are giving us medicine. Palabra Training Center is dedicated to creating a more compassionate and just world by training those who are invested and committed to making change possible. We offer writing workshops, mental wellness retreats, and other ways that teach emotional and psychological flexibility through mindfulness practices. And those practices teach together our inner and outer world in a harmonious, healing manner. We welcome people from all walks of life, financial means, and physical challenges to join us. If you would like to learn more or feel inspired to become a supporter, please visit palabracenter.org. And again, you are listening to What a Word is Worth. Today, my guest is writer and activist, Patricia Dawn, and I am so honored to have her here. Patricia is the author of the young adult novel, Rebels by Accident. Her writing has appeared on Salon, in the Village Voice, The Nation, LA Weekly, the Christian Science Monitor, and the anthology Love Inshallah, the Secret Love Lives of American Muslim Women in Other Places. She has been Senior Director of the Writing Institute at Sarah Lawrence College and is co-founder of the Joe Papaleo Writers Workshop in Italy. This Italian-American um, pop-raised rebel has traveled the world um, these days, she can be found on uh, her living room couch working on her next novel or Zooming with aspiring and established writers, of course, always in a suit and tie. Last stop on the six, her first novel for adults is um, just had out of the press and we will be um, conversing today about that um, novel and about her life in general. So um, I am, as I say, glad and honored to have her here. So welcome back. It is an honor and a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much. It's such an honor. I can't think of a better um, way to spend the last day of this year um, than talking with you. Um, so thank you so much for having me. Yes, that is true. We are closing um, 2022, uh, 2021 together. Hopefully we'll close 2022 together as well. Um, so I want this conversation to be a little bit about everything, but since uh, the last stop on the six is, is brand new, like head of the press, I want us to focus the conversation on that. So on the novel, the last stop on the six, which I think is a, such a remarkable depiction of Italian American life in the Bronx, but also a book that exemplifies the life of many immigrant families in other conclaves. So tell me about the seeds of this book and tell me a little bit about the, the writing, what the writing process was like for you. Okay, um, so this, when I tell people this, they either get inspired or discouraged. So um, hopefully it'll be more inspiration. Um, I started this book in my MFA program uh, more than 25 years ago. Yeah. And I didn't know that I was actually writing a novel. I was writing stories and I wanted to get into a 
class because I really admired this one professor. And I got into her class and I was so excited and then was told that she was gonna make it a novel class. And that I was asked, so do you have a novel that you're writing? And I'm like, oh yeah. And so that's how it started. <laughs> so it wasn't even a conscious effort. Um, and then I um, wrote and wrote and wrote and graduated from my MFA program, had my daughter. Um, I remember even, I think I was breastfeeding while I was like writing like versions of this book by hand. Um, and then I finally sent it out and I did get my first agent with it, but when my first agent, um, accepted the book, she said, you know, I love the book, but I can't sell fiction right now. Uh, Canada just declared this year, the death of the novel. So let's talk about nonfiction. And I was like, okay, so that was a little discouraging. Um, but I kept working on it and, um, eventually moved on to other agents and, you know, have a great agent now, but, um, it was a, but a long process, a lot of revision. And then I finally just said, all right, I got to put this in the drawer. And my first book that got published, I started writing just as kind of a distraction from this book. Cause I didn't really know, um, what to do with it. And then, um, when wasn't going to ever go back to this book until um, a very good uh, friend and a writer um, that I know, uh, Jim and Han, um, said, why don't you go back to that book? Because she was in that first workshop along with another person who's in a writing group, uh, Kate Brandt. Um, we've been writing together for a lot of years. And I said, nope, you know, I'm very stubborn. I'm like, that's it. It's, it's, it's gone. It's over with. It helped me learn about writing and I just don't want to go back to it. And of course, you know, she pushed, you know, in her nice subtle way. Um, and then I pulled it out or, you know, off my computer screen. And I looked and said, well, maybe there's something there. I showed it to an editor friend and she thought there was something there, but I realized that I'd finally, after decades of writing and teaching, became, I guess you could say, and you know, Grace Paley was a short story writer, used to say this, I had to become the person that I became or grow into the person that could actually finish the book. And so I cut probably 150 pages and uh, rewrote a lot of it. And I think it's funny because the original essence is still there, but I had to fictionalize it a lot more to get to the truth of this particular family. Um, wow. So, you know, I guess what I would also want to tell writers is people always use the big T word, you know, yeah. and we always talk about like talent and, you know, talent, I don't even know what that means, but tenacity will get you um, a lot further. Yeah. So if you have a choice, don't mm -hmm. worry. If you don't have a choice, just hang in there with it because yeah, it can happen, but you need a lot of support and a lot of other people around you that kind of believe and understand what you're doing because it was a lot of ups and downs. So yeah. anyway. I yeah. like that. I like what you're saying. And I also love the idea um, and the images that you use in, in describing the process, like the breastfeeding, the um, nesting, the nurturing, the the seeding, the evolving um, nature of this book and how um, it took that, that long to be written. No wonder it's such a mature book. It's, it's, it's so... Um, as I was telling you before, I'm completely enamored, um, fascinated by by the book. It's the the reading is completely fluid, and one of the things that I appreciate the most about a book is the uh, polished, um, you know, nature of good books where every word is in the right place, and that's what I failed in reading the novel. So I, I so much appreciate what you're saying about the process and all the, 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 the ways in, you, in which you describe. And it, where this is taking me, I also have heard you say before that everyone has a story to tell. Mm -hmm. And I agree as someone who, who facilitates um, writings myself, I know that, um, Everyone has a story to tell. My question to you is, how do you choose 
the particular angles of your own story to portray it in your writing? What makes a story worth telling? I, you know, that's a good question. It's actually a great question. Um, I think there's sometimes a combination of, um, cause a lot of it is like, you know, I do a lot of free writes with people and even myself prompts, right? And all these free writes and prompts is just to get you not to think because uh -huh. there's something in your subconscious that what you're meant to write will start to come out. And I think that uh, that's my, I don't usually go at a story like I want to write about this unless of course in my nonfiction, if it's an assignment, that's one thing, but otherwise it's usually like something gets tapped into and, um, and then it's a process of just like feeling almost um, like you feel obsessed. Like I have to tell the story. You don't always know why, but also, I think being in community, um, it's funny because where you said even a minute ago about every word and, you know, I would have to give credit to the editors and my readers, you know, um, they were phenomenal and it, books like children don't get like raised alone, right? It's in community, right? Um, and I think that sometimes you don't even know what your story is until you have some rough first draft and then you go back and you look and all, you know, all the rules and answers is in that first draft. And sometimes you can't see it, which is why, you know, I teach writing as well. And people will, I'll give them ideas or suggestions and they'll think, oh my goodness, you're a genius. And I'm like, no, you're the genius. Cause what I'm seeing is just what's there. So you need people around you sometimes to point out where the story really is. And then you kind of for yourself will think, well, if that's what people are seeing, is that where I want to lean into or do I want to go in another direction? And that it's like, it's really, I mean, I know people, sounds cliche, but writing is, is revision and it's rewriting and rewriting until, and I think that is we can, a lot of writing happens sometimes in our heads or as, you know, we're walking and, you know, as we're living life, we're still writing, but I think when you sit down and, and commit words to the page, whether by hand or on your computer, that's when something starts to happen. And um, until you can, you start doing that and letting yourself give over to that. And that's the hardest thing that a writer has to do, but your answers will come through writing. Um, when you're stuck on a character or anything, you know, you just got to keep writing through it. Um, and I have been blocked many times, but I, understand when people say there's no such thing as writer's block because really writer's block is just you getting in your own way um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and because we're all self-critical like right we're all we got that editor in our heads telling or that voice where it came from or the many voices saying why we can't do it why our stories don't matter and you can't always shut those voices up so, you know, a strategy I tell people is, well, just write it out and you'll get more tired of writing uh, out those voices and then you'll move into the story you need to tell. But um, sometimes, you know, you could, I know people have published and successfully many, many, many books and they still have that voice that's telling them why they can't do it. And so basically you got to just tell the voice to shut up and just keep going um, because all the answers is just to, you just write through it. Yeah. And as I say that, I, you know, with all the promotion around the book and all that stuff, I haven't been doing a lot of writing. And so I'm been thinking, well, I want to work on this new project, which is more first time I'm really going to, I think, be sinking into more of a memoir. Um, and I'm kind of feeling blocked. And I know the way to be unblocked is just to write and be willing to write badly. Do you know, I mean, you know, everyone is probably, I don't know if everyone who's listening or watching has heard about Anne Lamont, but you mm -hmm. know, she's got this great book called Bird by Bird I'm Writing. Right. They call that shitty first draft. And mm -hmm. it's okay to have a messy draft because mm -hmm. that's where you'll figure out where you want to go. So I think I went off the subject a little bit. Uh, I think, but I, I think, you know, our last um, guest here at the uh, podcast, Alexandria Peary, was talking about the importance of accessing the river within, um, and it has to be accessed 
by silencing the, um, let's call it the inner critic. So I think, yes, I'm, I'm agreeing with what you are saying in terms of, um, you know, my question is how do you mm, determine which story is worth telling? And, and then I, I like what you did with the answer in terms of, it's not an individual thing. I love that. Um, there are other people helping you shape that. And uh, but be, but before we get to that, there has to be that giving permission to yourself, yeah. um, that accessing the um, inner flowing river, um, which comes from the unconscious, and then applying the big T. I love that. I big I I love the the concept of the big T as in tenacity. Um, as the thing that then um, allows us to, to do the completion. But going back to my question about accessing that initial seed, um, you know, part of that seed is within your story, but I'm wondering how much other people's stories permeate your telling, your, your own story, and... And then how do you, uh, what are your thoughts about appropriation then if, you know, if that happens? Right? Uh, well, I think, yeah, it's appropriation is, um, it's, it's, I think it's something that even before it was the thing that people were talking about, I think, yeah. uh, and, you know, 25 years ago in writing workshops or outside of writing workshops with other writers we would be talking about okay well who has a right to write what stories right. and there was this idea that i used to believe and i'm not sure if i believe it so well now but that you can write anything as long as you do it well and you're responsible and um, that you're you know um and that you you know share it if you're with the communities or the people that you think you're writing about and i don't think i feel that anymore um I, and it's hard to know exactly always what is your story, right? Like I'm, a, yes, I'm Italian American. I grew up in this place called Pelham Bay, but a lot of the stories within that um, world, there's much as the people like that live there as mine. And, and it's also my view of it, right? So, um, so appropriate. And there are things that I chose not to write about because, um, appropriation is a big idea. And I think that, I don't know, if we spent the next billion years and, you know, I don't know about numbers, but, um, but only um, publishing, you know, uh, people of color and underrepresented yeah. voices, we still would not make up for people whose stories need to be told. Um, so, but that doesn't mean that people shouldn't be telling their own stories and but what makes your own story I think we know um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think well you know it's not I get a lot of writers and I you know who when they're writing stories that are based on you know people in their lives or they're writing what they call memoir nonfiction, and they'll say I really want to write this story but I can't because I don't want to upset this person in my family or that person or you know and my advice is well you'd be surprised that people often, if you're writing a character that's fully developed, even if you're writing things that may be bad, they never see themselves in it. Mm -hmm. um, and, but also you're, you know, you gotta just write the story you're gonna write. And then if you're worried about the people in your lives, you share it with them before you, you know, you go further. But I think if you self um, edit yourself and censor yourself before the story gets out, you'll never tell that story. Um, but when it comes to, it's, there are certain stories that I wouldn't tell because they're not my stories to tell. Um, and then I started thinking, I was thinking about writing a story, um, a nonfiction piece about my relationship with my daughter and then backed off because I'm like, well, it's not my story, it's her story. And then thought about it and says, well, but this part of it's my story. I mean, it's, it's complicated. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that the fact that we're asking these questions are what's really important um, and that we are willing to, you know, step back or we have to step back 
and say, all right, why am I, uh, you know, this isn't my personal experience, but uh, why am I writing a story about, um, you know, this person, you know, who I'm, you know, uh, well, I'm trying to like, uh, I don't want to like give something away from, for, right, uh, right. But I was just basically saying, why am I writing a story about another person, another culture, another everything that, um, because I don't want to really talk about my own world um, mm -hmm. experiences. And that's often sometimes why people, I think, choose to write because they're really tr trying to access something that they want to tell, but they feel like they can't do it through their own lives, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I know, it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's hard to um, decide what, what part, because there are so many stories that we have to tell and yeah. how you figure out, okay, what's the focus? I mean, the, with Last Stop on the Six, if you, the, they were, I mean, as my first book, I put everything in the kitchen, the bathroom, mm -hmm. everything mm -hmm. in it. And then, because yeah. you really feel like you're never going to write another book, right? So everything goes in it. And then you realize, oh, wait a minute. I got to pull a lot of things out for the real story to come through. Um, and I think figuring out what that is, for me, it, it always has to come through some sort of unconscious way. And I hate doing prompts. Um, and even my writing group, we've been meeting 25 years and we all hate it. But, you know, there's a few of us in the group, there's one person in particular that always makes us do it. And every book I've started or story has been through a prompt that gets me you know not thinking and I don't about whatever and even if it feels unrelated to what I am working on at the time it always seems yeah. to be connected but it gets me to stop thinking and stop um, and then I will look at what I'm writing and say okay so what is authentic about what I've written yeah. I think that's the thing um, at the point yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you know, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, what I, what you were saying about it's not my story to tell, but then there is a part of the story that it is yours. Um, so so I I think what I hear you saying is that there is the relational. <laughs> what is that? Yeah, please tell me because I don't know what I'm saying. Okay, that I think there is that piece of relational dynamic yeah. that when you encounter a story when you encounter another person there is something that is yours in that exchange yeah. and that uh, you know the idea of um staying clear if we, we want to call it like that from appropriation is speaking from your perspective speaking yeah. from your end on that relational dynamic. Yeah. I, I really like that. Um, I think that's what I heard you say. No, I think that's what yeah. uh, you said it much more eloquently than I did, but I think that's what I'm yeah, getting at. And I think with uh -huh. fiction, it's a little trickier, right? Because, yeah. you know, but at the same time, it's still, you know, you still, it's still the same, like if there are rules, it's still the same yeah. process right um yeah. you may take you know multiple characters but each one of those characters is a piece of you in them right um like yes. I finished a book with that had a serial killer in it right mm -hmm. i don't have to be a serial killer to like right. write that character but right. i did have to tap into a lot of things in this particular character's personality mm -hmm. and way of thinking and looking at the world that i could relate to um yes. that you know i mean maybe uncomfortable for people to think but a lot of us see the world like maybe you're or you know i don't know if there's an average serial killer but i had to work very hard to make this person be somebody who was capable of love and there's a relationship between a father and a daughter and so i actually related more to the serial killer than the daughter in the in this particular story because I really was able to go to a place that was somewhere that inside me, right? And then nothing yes. to do, you know. And I think that's, if we do that when we're writing, and sometimes we kind of, uh, we know when we're being, I guess, not true to 
ourselves or to our story. And, um, and then, you know, and a lot of times, and look, it's fine. If people are writing because they want to publish or, you know, they're, you know, they're writing to an audience, um, you know, or market really. Um, only thing I'd warn is, you know, that's fine. But just know that if you're not writing something you want to write, by the time you finish whatever you're writing, that market is probably going to change. So you better write whatever you want to write because if you just, you know, I mean, and if you're writing specific genre commercial fiction, you know, there are certain formulas you follow and, but if it's not something that you enjoy doing, then why are you wasting your time writing, you know, something that may change next week, right? So I think that's the thing that we need to figure out, like why, I mean, that's the big question when I, you know, I teach a novel class, and I'm always asking students, okay, what, well, I asked them to write about why they're writing the story, what's important about it, because when you're revising it, if you could figure out why, you, who you're telling it for, or why you're telling it, why it matters, then when you revise, you can look through that lens, Yeah. right? Um, and I think through that lens of why it matters, then that's where it becomes authentic and questions of appropriation um, will come up because you'll also okay. know whether you're being like true to something or not, or, you know. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, going back again to that idea of tapping on common humanity, um, if you are writing on a subject, there is always um, a little bit of me in you and yes. vice versa, right? So remembering that, I really appreciate that you're, you're bringing that up and, and how important it is for us as writers to, to remember that, that, that um, first also what you were saying that um, even a serial killer has that inner goodness. Mm -hmm. um, and in that if you as a writer, you can access that through your own experience, through your own bonding with the humanness in that other. Then, and even, yeah, and yeah. even the ugliness too. Right? Yes. Um, right. Right. Yeah. You know, we may not act on in that same way, but we have those like moments of like you know that where things aren't so pretty, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you know, and so I, you hear all the time about people not liking characters, right? Mm -hmm. And I heard oh, I wish I could remember which writer it was, but I got to hear a writer speak, and the smart one, you know, it was one of the, those things that just stick with you. And this was many mm -hmm. years ago, but he said people don't have to like your characters. They just have to be invested where they want to read about them because I may not want to sit like Hannibal Lecter is like one of my favorite characters of all time because uh -huh. the writer gets you sympathy. You, you sympathize with a character that basically eats people, right? It's very hard to do that, but because there's a humanity in that character. And so for character, you may not want to have lunch, obviously <laughs> with that person. <laughs> with um, someone who will eat yeah, you. Yeah, exactly. But you, you know, but you've, you, you're compelled to read about mm -hmm. them because you don't have to like characters. You just have to care enough about them. And I think that um, one of the greatest compliments that I've gotten on Last Stop was um, someone I know that lives out in New Orleans, like left a message uh, um, on my voicemail and uh, was said like, this, your book is sick, sick meaning in a good way. Yeah, I can't yeah. believe it, like loved it. And then, said, you know, you know, I married and it was, this person was married twice, but I married both those families. And so when we <laughs> talked later, I said, I didn't know your first and second wife was Italian American. And they're like, no, they're Creole. And I'm like, oh, he's like, no, but it's the same, you know, the, the dynamics, the chaos, the, 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 you know, the love and the dysfunction was completely there for him. And yeah. so that actually made me feel good because it made me feel like, wow, there's something universal in that experience of like a lot of families. Um, and I think that what was important for this book and for this story was that it was a, a working class family that you don't read a lot about in a lot of the books that I've read, you know? Um, and that there's a dynamic to this family that a lot of people have related to, even if they don't have that particular background. And books that I enjoy too are very similar. I mean, the characters may, are usually nothing like, you know, my particular background at all, but there's something about their experiences that I can, that like talks to me, right? And so when that connection's made, that's yeah. 
you know, and we all have that connection with each other. Um, I think yeah. we don't always... I, I actually want to piggyback on that comment from that reader because my next question is actually about that because there was a very strong resonance. I felt um, when I was reading the novel and especially my question is about around the male characters and how um, they are portrayed as, I want to say, lost souls looking to be reflected in the mirrors of life in the Bronx and, and Pelham Bay. Each male character is somewhat stopped mid-air success, <laughs> mid-air of success, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Right? So... Yeah. Is there a story of intergenerational pain that you want us to see? Because that's what I, what I got, and and that similarity, I was like, yeah, Billy, yeah, Billy the, the artist, yeah, yeah. Um, he can be. Um, well, he, actually, he's the most. Um, I, in rewriting the book, I've like I mm -hmm. fictionalized and leaned into things a lot that were not um, autobiographical. But yeah. Billy um, is many parts of many people, including oh. myself, that I knew. He's the most fictional. He's not, like, you know, there are other characters. The mother character is closest to the, my real mother um, oh. it, than, than any other character in the book, yeah, oh. including the narrator. Um, and But the Billy character was uh, a a composite of a lot of people um, yeah. and probably without consciously realizing it, the part of me that's always that like, you know, frustrated, you know, um, the frustrated artist, former kind of mm -hmm. addict, whatever you're addicted to in life and, you know, who's just trying um, to just be a part because I always felt like I was on the outside of things because I was in an Italian neighborhood, but we were the Americans because we were Italian American. Mm -hmm. Everyone else mm -hmm. was born in Italy, right? That the original book was the other side mm -hmm. of what? Right? Mm -hmm. Everybody was from the other side, which meant Southern Italy, right? So, um, and I think that Billy character for me, um, through the art part, it seems to be like the one who achieves, I think, the most personal success in his life personally and and because i think he goes in his life i think he struggles through a lot of pain um and comes out of it in a way that i don't think anybody else in the book fully is fully as realized as this that character um uh -huh. and i think it is because he makes the art that he does um and it, without going away from his own roots and stuff, if that makes sense. Um, and, and, but I'm going back to my question though, were you thinking, or am I reading too much into it? Were you thinking about this um, intergenerational pain, that pain that gets recycled from one generation, you know, the broken dreams? Because that's what I, I hear in most of the characters is these, you know, striving to get someplace and then life getting in the way. I wasn't thinking about, I was right when I was writing the male characters, I don't think I thought about it that clearly because uh, they were based on different male characters I knew. And the women in my particular world were very strong in that sense. And the men, you know, either gained their strength or their identity through those women in some ways. Um, but as I went, when I went back to the book, it was more conscious. And then mm -hmm. you see things later on that you couldn't see, you know, thanks mm -hmm. to great therapists in my life, um, you know, you get to a point where you're like, oh, I have to lean further into this. So mm -hmm. even the father character, um, who was originally based on my father, there's a lot of my father in there, but my father wasn't like an alcoholic, like this character, but I had to lean into those things and into the, um, broken dreams and um and and the uh and what makes failure and what makes success and you know and is it, and i had to lean in i protected in the first version of these characters especially uh -huh. the men it's mm -hmm. like, a lot of 
lot of women who tend to do that. Mm -hmm. And in the revising of it, I had to stop protecting and I had to lean into the sadder parts of the truth. Yeah. Um, but that was all like, that came later, I think, because mm -hmm. you know, I wasn't conscious of that until they were already written and they'd already become, you know, it's cliche to say your characters tell you their stories if you let them, but they do. They start becoming real. And if you let them and you lead, they will lead you. I think when I was getting in my own way was when I was just trying to protect everyone and make everybody like, you know, okay. And, and not, you know, as messed up as and complicated as people can really be in life. And so um, that was not intentional at first, but it became more intentional as I revised because, wow. and, I, and that was hard. I have to say some of it was even painful to do because, you know, you don't want to always sit there and like see your characters make mistakes. I mean, they become like, you know, Right. children children yeah you know it's funny writing a book they'd say you know i've heard people say it's like giving birth it's more like putting yeah. kid through college and graduate school and yeah. then still watching them like uh you know make their mistakes right so um yeah so i think that's kind of so yes i think that was not as conscious that in the beginning but became that later I think you you do a remarkable job in in creating suspense too, and and especially um, you know let's stay with this idea of what you did with the characters, um, you know with the introduction of uh, the way you introduce uh, Jimmy, um, and also the the relational tension and the pain um, that was coming from, from his story, his character, the disappearance um, and how he kept us uh, kind of on and great expectations and great interest uh, at high volume. At least that's how I feel. Like no, it well, was so- that, that, Yeah, and that came mm -hmm. much later. That, and the, I think that mm -hmm. was like in the last, uh, you know, the last year of finishing the book is when that storyline came through because, yeah. uh, um, you know, a, the, a writer friend of mine, you know, Jim and said, like, we were talking about plot and, mm -hmm. and actually I just found the piece of paper that she was like writing things out. Well, this happens, that happens. And we realized, um, you know, something, I don't know, Jimmy disappearing, like made a lot of sense, but mm -hmm. the accident, all that, then I had to, you know, as as teachers, we say this to writers, you got to always raise the stakes. Yeah. And I was told, okay, where you got to raise the stakes, you got to raise the stakes. And so in doing that, and I'm great at like, you know, I'm one of those annoying people that will watch TV movies with you and then tell you the ending before it happens. But it's kind of hard to, but I had to keep that tension within the story. And that did not start to happen until, I mean, like much later on in the in the in the final version of the revision process in the recent years when I went back to it, it wasn't in the beginning. Um, originally, um, the you know the main character who's even an activist, she wasn't that like you know super activist. Uh, she had a boyfriend that she kind of followed, and that character got cut. You know, um, but especially the, the fact that uh, when she comes home, you know the disappearance of the person she doesn't want to face the most is gone. Right. Um, yeah, that didn't come until much later on because by that time also you realize if you're writing and you know, you're also teaching writing, you, you learn enough to realize something's gotta happen, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and so I figured, all right, what would be her biggest fear, you know, is those twists and turns is facing this person she hasn't seen in 10 years for reasons we, I don't want to give away. Mm -hmm. Right buy the book, um, mm -hmm. you know, or take it out in your library. Um, but then what would be your biggest fear? You think your biggest fear is facing the person and then you, it becomes the bigger fear that the person's not there, right? And you don't know where they are and nobody wants to tell you if they know, right? So then that becomes, so that just kept leading to one thing led to another, led to another and stuff. So, and then also what I really wanted this book to be about um, is the misconceptions you know, there's that question, can you go home again? And yeah. we can only go home, but the home that we go back to is usually not the home that we have in our heads. And so what I wanted this to be also be about is somebody who 
goes home and has all these misconceptions about who these people were or are and who she is in relationship to them, but also the place she grew up and being, you know, and she finds herself trapped in a world of stereotypes in her head that, you know, she, that she developed as after she left this world. And um, so she had to relearn or even learn, maybe she never really even knew the people because you don't always yeah. know the people that are closest to you. So I kind of wanted that to be about what does it mean to go home? It's like, you know, we have this idea of what home is and then we go back to it and we're like, why isn't everything exactly the way Where it is home? <laughs> yeah, and, what, and why isn't everything, well, what do you mean that, you know, yeah. in 10 years, somebody moved the couch or whatever? Because it's like, well, maybe the couch wasn't even there to be in with because it's, you mm -hmm. know, the way our memories like work, yeah. good or bad, right? So. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things that, that truly comes, um, clearly comes through um, throughout the book. And, you know, one of the people who, um, commented on on your book one of the blurbs um the one by melissa how do you say her name yeah, Falvavino. Falvavino. yeah she's a, a Falvavino and she Falvavino. was a wonderful writer uh, from new jersey she's telling yeah uh, jersey. no 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 not, my god not new jersey she'll kill me she's from the midwest excuse me <laughs> um but she wrote a great collection of short stories called tomboy land um and she's also okay. American background, but um, she's a wonderful yeah. writer. Yeah. So I like what she says. She says that that um, your novel is is a rebroing love song to the Bronx, and 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 she also says that it's a love song about the places that make us who we are. So my question is, how much of the Bronx girl is still in you? I mean, here you are, well-traveled woman, far away from the crowdedness of uh, Pelham Bay. And so, so tell me more about instances well, well, where... Fine. Yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. Where, tell me more about instances where the Bronx girl shows up or if there are times where you want her to become invisible, totally. Well, I think when I first left uh, the Bronx and then went, you know, I was still, I, I started, I went, I was in many colleges, but my first college was Barnard in New York. And I was still use, saying, use, use guys. And <laughs> I remember getting shamed into not using that word anymore. And um and when I think about it now, I'm thinking, well, use is, makes sense as a plural of you. But anyway, right. um, but I still had that heavy, I lost my Bronx accent. It comes out uh, every once in a while, especially when I'm angry. But um, I lost it in Manhattan when I was a student there, which is very funny. Um, but I remember, it's funny when I read what Melissa wrote, I would not in the earlier versions of this, it would have been, it was anything but a love tribute to the Bronx yeah. because uh, when I left Pelham Bay, I never wanted to return. And um, I only remembered what was bad and negative and like the ugly parts of it, right? And it took me a long time to see that there was beauty and that there was love in, you know, even things that were messed up, right? Uh, but that took me a lot of years to see that. So, I think I've leaned more into the Bronx girl I've gotten older. Um, the same way, if you would have said to me 10 years ago, even five years ago, maybe, like you just like your mother, I would have said that is like a horrible thing to say. And now when people say that to me, I'm like, wow, that is wonderful. I wish I could be like my mother, right? So I think, you know, at 57, I've kind of like embraced. I wish I think I was more of the Bronx girl than maybe sometimes I am um, because there's something that's, um, there's a, you know, there's this toughness that people think Bronx kids have. And I remember we'd go to the Jersey shore and the guys, you know, a friend of mine's mother would take a bunch of teenagers out to the shore and the guys would would all act tough because the mm -hmm. guys out there used to think they were so tough because they were from the Bronx and they weren't. Um, so I think we lean into that toughness because people think you're tough if you're from the Bronx, right. but, but we're really so vulnerable. Um, yeah. And 
there's so much insecurity. I think there's a shared insecurity, you know, mm -hmm. uh, me and a very good friend of mine from there. Um, we always say, um, we always apologize. We always say we're sorry. And when people first said, when I first said that to someone and they, sorry about something and they said, why are you sorry? You didn't have anything to do with it. It shocked me. I'm like, no, I'm not yeah. sorry because I was at fault. I'm sorry for your experience. But there's just ways uh -huh. to speak. But we do uh -huh. take blame for everything. And there's those superstitions that we talk about in the book that, yeah. I've, you know, that I played over the top, but they really do exist, right? Uh -huh. And we in that. So, but there's a beauty in that collectiveness and, and sharing a lot of that. Um, so I think I sometimes I wish it was more of that girl who, um, more of the character who like, um, or the Bronx girl that's like tough and, and is willing to like do what it takes to change the world, right? Uh -huh. um, then maybe I have in me now. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So in uh, along those lines of, of changing the world, um, I don't want to say much, like I, like you said before, I don't want to give the novel away. I want people to buy it and, and or get it from the yeah, library. The library yeah. But, but okay. tell me, um, there is a great deal of, of activism there, both about war and politics and, and climate change. So how hopeful are you? And you just well, said you want to be um you want that part of the girl the, the the Bronx girl that wants to make change so do you still believe in change as a possibility yeah I I have to um when I placed this book in 91 and this is like you know against the first Iraq war um mm -hmm. I was part of a I was an activist um and I was part of a very, you know, what grew into a very large anti-war movement. And mm -hmm. the media then, we didn't have social media. I mean, the biggest thing was right. Hollywood producer let us use his office and there was a fax machine, right? That was our big thrill, right? Because we didn't have to like mail things, right? Um, we could fax press releases. But we had like tens of thousands of people out, including people with bands that were like, hit their fame, like the Red Hot Chili Peppers when they first had their big hit. And the media would cover the five pro-war people across the street, right? And somebody who had wanted to be a journalist before that, that used to, it was so disheartening. But I really believed that we were going to be able to stop this war before it happened. And in writing the book and, and researching and all that stuff, I realized, you know, of course, the war was already going to happen and decided on way before we had that, those demonstrate, you know, it was already a done deal, especially in the book, right? The, the, which is there was a demonstration a few days before when UN actually declared that they supported the uh, decision to go to war. We still thought we were going to stop that, right? And right. there was this naive belief that I don't even want to say naive. Uh, there was a belief because there was people young and old and people that came out who had protested in the Vietnam War and who hadn't been at a protest in, you know, in decades at that point, 20 something years, who actually believed that they could do something. And there was something in that collective power that gave me so much hope. And I see a lot of that today. Um, I see a lot of that with um, Black Lives Matter, uh, you know, mm -hmm. with that, the Me Too movement. I mean, there's a lot of young people and older people, but I think the youth today give me hope because they're not. Honestly, I don't know how they just don't like crawl under the covers and just like yeah. shut the lights and say, that's it. I, but they don't, you know, I mean, they're, I mean, right now, I don't know what it would be like to be 22 and not have mm -hmm. been able to like leave home, right? Mm -hmm. at, at 18 mm -hmm. and have to stay home, but they're managing it and they're making it work. And, you know, and as bad as technology can be, they're also using it in ways even the fact that we can have this conversation, right? Um, so uh, look, there's, there's a lot of ugliness in the world. There's a lot of like, uh, you know, people that are making a lot of money and, you know, and giving back very little and exploit exploitation. And, but all that stuff has been, you know, here. I mean, this country has been, was, you know, everyone's like, oh, let's, let's go back to what we were. We were founded by 
very wealthy white men mm. who basically don't want to pay taxes. Okay. So right. you know, why we think that like, we want to go back to that. Um, I, I don't want to go back to that. I think that we have a chance to like, I hope to make things better, but I know it's not going to be from me. The best yeah. I can do is to hear younger people and to like follow and not necessarily yeah. lead, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's the hard part because, you know, mm -hmm. you think you know it all and, and mm -hmm. it's hard not to be, I'm somewhat jaded, right? And mm -hmm. to like, and then when I hear somebody or, you know, see my, somebody that's young and the changes that they're making, or I work with a lot of college kids that are filling out or, or high school kids filling out their college application and I hear why they want to go to school. And when I still hear their dreams and hopes and I'm like, yeah, the world doesn't have to stop, but they understand, you know, that things have to change or a lot of them do. And I don't know if um, it was as universal as I feel it is now. And I don't know whether I'm being naive or not, but I do think there's, there's hope. I 20, I didn't have a lot of faith in this year. I think 21 was better than 20, but even 19, 2019. And I mean, even before the man who shall go nameless, uh, you know. Right, it, please. Probably, yeah, yeah. We still had a lot of like, stuff i mean there's been like horrible stuff except that i mean that last administration brought it all out to the front yeah. and i think that now that things are exposed you can't not see it right you have to know it exists right and i think that there's hope in that there's hope yeah. in people seeing that truth and so do i have hope i have to if you don't have hope you know what do you have right um, yeah yeah so i think it's yeah. important to have hope and if you can't have hope alone mm -hmm find others and have hope together. You know, I mean, yeah. there was a great friend of mine that once said, I know you're too much in pain. This is, I was going through a very hard mm -hmm. time um, many, many years ago. And um, he said, I will hold the faith for you. And I remember, Beautiful. yeah. And I have said that to many people over the years yeah. as something that I would know that meant so much to me because just hearing somebody say that to me, whether you believe in God or whatever, it doesn't matter. But somebody saying that you can't, have faith right now, but I can have it for you. I think we need to just be able to step up and hold faith for each other. Um, yeah, I really, I really like the um, this idea of holding the faith and space for others. And I have one last question. It's somewhat related to what we are talking about, but it's you know, trauma seems to run through your book rather ubiquitously is like mm -hmm. so palpable um you know that shame self-blame guilt and grief are core parts of trauma so angela um it's guilt ridden mm -hmm. so much so that it takes her 10 years to come back home mm -hmm. so i wonder what you might have to say about these two listeners who are struggling with trauma in any shape or form. Um, what do you want people? Remember our podcast is about finding creative ways um, to bring, bring forward healing. So what do you want people to know? Well, um, you know, the world, mm -hmm. the, the trauma, the guilt, the, mm -hmm. that, Oh, welcome to my neighborhood, right? Um, mm -hmm. um, I, I want people to know that a lot of, you know, guilt, often the things that we feel guilty for are, are things that, we ha we, that we're not responsible for. And the forgiveness that we need to find is for ourselves is the hardest thing in the world. Um, and there's that expression of treat, you know, um, I think it's like treat others as you have, as you treat, as you'd want them, as you treat right. yourself. Mm -hmm. And then the same very smart person once said, no, 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 we treat ourselves horribly. Don't treat others as you treat yourself. <laughs> treat yourself as you would treat others. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think I can't, you know, speak for the various traumas that people have gone through and how deep they are, but I know that you can't, it's the same thing with writing. You, uh, you don't have to do it alone and you don't have to suffer in silence and it doesn't get better if you ignore it. It only comes out 
in ways that are usually more hard, harder than they would have been if you seek the help. And, and sometimes they don't, it doesn't have to be the direct way of talking about it. Sometimes it maybe it could be through art. Um, it could be through writing fiction. It could be through painting. I mean, there's a lot of ways of expressing it, but if you don't let it out um, and with support from others, because we are meant to be in community, um, even if it's online, it's fine. I mean, it's, it's with uh -huh. others. Um, then we then really we are in a lot of trouble. Um, but for people, when I said before about everybody's stories matter, they don't only matter for ourselves, but they matter for each other because it's all our collective stories that are connected that I feel if we have a chance as a human, as the human like species, it's through those stories. That's the one thing that we have in common, no matter who we are. Um, and I think that some and those stories of trauma have to be told and shared because for others to be able to hear them even and know that they're not alone in that there's a healing that can happen um and and guilt and being feeling guilty or bad in silence usually even with this character and i will give this away like she discovers that what she's been guilty of feeling guilty about mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. something be guilty about right 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 you know yeah. or but i guess it's like and this is very hard to do but um i think we all as a we need to be honest and open but and try to be kind to each other and that doesn't mean being kind by not telling uh -huh. the truth it just learning is learning how to tell our own truth and 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 to find support systems and they're out there. So I think healing starts with just that first word or that first painting or that first, you know, whatever. Um, I don't know if I'm making a lot yeah. of sense, but I, I think, think you are. I think you like are. organizations like yours, mm -hmm. yours Marianella, are so important because mm -hmm. I mean, the work you do, um, I'm in awe of. Um, because every day you make a difference to so many people and the people that you work with that go reach out there. And I've gone on retreats that you've run and, and, and I've attended writing workshops that you've done. And it's like, they make such a difference and you can see the power or the empowerment. I mean, it's an overused word, but the joy, even the moments of like relief, even and peace that people find when they're like in that collective space or working with others that can kind of guide them and people, we need guides, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, if you don't want to call them therapists, call them guides or whatever, but if without those guides, we're all be in a lot of trouble. And we need yes. One last thing. There's two people. I, I keep quoting the same person who <laughs> many, many years, but I think she's the one who said this or somebody else did, or maybe many people, but there are two kinds of people in this world, those in therapy and those who should be. Um, and, whatever your therapy is you need to have that yeah. spiritual connection and that healing process but it doesn't happen alone we wouldn't yeah. be human if it did you know yeah thank you so so much well, for closing you you. <laughs> and closing with with those remarks and i will say that one of the things that i like the most about last step on the six is that it really has the ingredients for collective healing. Um, there is humor, there is wisdom, there is tough love, there is a little bit of everything here, the, the, the good, the, uh, the bad, the in-between, everything is here. So I'm, I, I really hope that our listeners will get your book and benefit from the beautiful wisdom that is there. So I thank you so much for joining me in this conversation. And thank you, listeners yeah. and viewers. Thank you for listening can just, to- Can I say one last thing? Yes. And I, I should have said this sooner when you said humor, people just laugh more together. We just need to laugh. Yeah. Yes. So yes. Thanks. That's good medicine. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for listening to what a word is worth. You can access today's interview at Anchor and um, it will also be available on YouTube. And if you are interested, hit the subscribe button in your podcast app. And also if you found